When James Ferris and Aaron Cranich were emailing, Aaron Cranich had the audacity to say that I had not made any complaints. And it was the furthest thing from the truth. He also made a few, like, out, just outright lies. I can't even, there was one that was really upsetting. I can't remember it now. But, but James Ferris immediately called him out on it. So when he called him out on it, what did he say back after that? I would love Change to just pull, <laughs> I can pull my laptop out and read them to you. Okay, we'll go, go, go. If you it. want. Go get it. <laughs> Email from me to Aaron Cranich, the Director of Labor Relations, uh -huh. no longer working there. And it says, yeah. Dear Aaron, I worked Friday, Saturday and Sunday in the ER and I have not been paid today. I have spoken with Harold, Harold in payroll who asked me to call the benefits department. I spoke with Courtney in the benefits department, department who asked me to call Diane Lulak, another woman in the benefits department, and I have been unable to get anything but an answering machine. I have left a few messages. Is there any way you can arrange for me to be paid, please? Thank you, Dana. He responded, Hi, Dana. I followed up with the nursing payroll department and they confirmed that due to the dates of the payroll schedule, you will be paid for the 27th and the 28th on October 10th, which is seven days from when I wrote the email. Further, based on the payroll schedule, you will be paid for work performed on the 29th on the 17th of October, which is two weeks away along with any other days that you worked on the current schedule. That's when I called James Ferris from the union. He wrote this email. Aaron, I am not sure what error took place with submitting Miss Novak's timesheet, but the hospital is contractually obligated to pay her within three working days after such errors are identified. With this in mind, the hospital has until Tuesday 10 slash 8 means October 8th to issue a check to Miss Novak. The response from Aaron Cranich to that email to James Ferris says as far as I can see there was no error. That's all it says. Oh. And then James Ferris responded huh with a question mark she worked before the end of the pay period and wasn't paid on payday. How is that not an error? Are you saying that nursing made a conscious decision to withhold her pay? James Ferris. No response to that. Oh, that was a good wisecrack, yeah. You mean no error like it did it on purpose. Yeah. Yeah. The next one is an email from me to Aaron. And I wrote, and this is now October 4th, I wrote, Aaron, just to be clear, I was given distinct instructions by Miss Wilson on Friday, 27th September 2013, where she says she was given a letter given to the nursing supervisor to give to the nursing office. Today I spoke with Annette Mendez, she's someone in the nursing, in the payroll office in person after two days of making calls and chasing down people who don't respond to my voicemails and emails, she informed me verbatim that the nursing supervisor had not submitted my hours to the payroll department until late Sunday 29th of September 2013. What's even more bizarre is that the nursing payroll office and the nursing office are both in the same office. She also states that I cannot be paid for another week. As per James Ferris email, I should be given a check within three days. Then James Ferris wrote on the 7th of October, he wrote to Aaron Cranich, Aaron, is Miss Novak being paid today? Then Aaron Cranich responds, according to nursing payroll, they spoke, this, is, this was outrageous, they spoke to Miss Novak on Friday, October 4th, and informed her that paperwork was done to pay her and two days owed to her. At the time she was told that it would be arranged for her to be paid on an off-cycle check on Thursday, October 10th, 
at, at the time, Ms. Novak raised no objection to this resolution of the issue. That's not true. I'm, I raised a lot of objections. Then James Ferris wrote <laughs> to Aaron Cranich, she talked to Nursing Payroll on October 3rd and followed up with an email to you on October 3rd, approximately at 2.51 p.m., stating she was not paid. There, was, uh, there were other emails from Ms. Novak raising her concern about not being paid. Also, I cannot find the section of the contract that allows the employer to delay paying an employee until the next pay cycle. Please refer me to that area that substantiates your position. Without this information, I will assume that the hospital believes it has the right to directly deal with Ms. Novak to make arrangements that are directly in violation of the contract. And then that was James Ferris to Aaron Cranich. Then I was angry at Aaron Cranich because he had claimed that I had made no complaints. And I oh, had you called him on. No, so I wrote him an email too. Uh, and I wrote, and I didn't hold back. <laughs> I, I wrote um, to Aaron Cranich, I'm outraged by these lies. Last Friday, October 4th, on my lunch break, I spent my entire break in the main payroll office where I spoke to Gil and Mr. Frank Nettle and, other, and another person who directed me to Annette Mendez in the nursing payroll office, spending almost all of my day off on the previous day, making phone calls to the hospital, leaving messages and talking to people at various times of day who'd asked me to call back later. After speaking with Mr. Netzel, I then walked back to the hospital to meet Annette Mendez at Mr. Netzel's instruction. I told Annette Mendez that I had spent the previous day making calls and leaving messages, including to her, and not one call had been returned. She was already aware of the situation when I arrived in her office. I informed her that as per NISNA, the New York State Nursing Association, which is the union, I must be paid within three business days of the last payday. She told me that there, that there is, in quotes, nothing I can do I insisted that as per the union contract, I demand to be paid and posed the question why she cannot arrange for my payment. She responded, I don't know what the union says, but our office cannot pay you until next Thursday. She explained that the employee health document that was supposed to come to her office in the previous week was not submitted to her office. I explained to her that that is not my mistake, nor is it my problem and that I expect to be paid for my work. Annette Mendez was flailing her arms around in the air, told me, I'm not going to repeat myself over and over. There is nothing I can do because our office did not receive the document from the nursing supervisor in time. She was, Annette Mendez was aggravated and didn't want to continue the conversation. Short of harassing her, there was not much I could do. Aaron Cranich, how dare you say that I raised no objection? And then I wrote Michotte Nabua, she's one of the nurses that I work with in the emergency room. She was covering my patients during my lunch break and I'm sure that she would be able to attest to the fact that I spent my entire lunch break trying to get my paycheck. Also, I should be paid for the one hour wasted chasing after my own paycheck. That's what I wrote to Aaron Cranich. <laughs> Did he ever respond? No. Well, not to that email, but then on October 9th, I was angry that he hadn't responded and I wrote him another email. And again, I didn't hold back. Um, I spent literally five hours making phone calls to human resources, and I use the term loosely, uh, where I spoke to Maureen, Courtney, I left messages for Diane Lulak, then made calls to payroll where I spoke to Gil and left a message for Mr. Nettle. I made calls to the nursing payroll, Annette Mendez, and left messages for her to also sending emails to yourself, Miss Wilson and James Ferris. I'm not coming to work tomorrow until I am paid and I'm not sick. <laughs> this will be reported to the NLRB 
as ongoing discriminatory retaliation against myself by yourself and your legal team at Roosevelt Hospital. Furthermore, I have still not been able to meet with Ms. Wilson regarding the hostile work environment which I am exposed to daily, despite many emails that I have sent to you and her. I am also waiting for you to give me a def definite response to my FMLA request. That was my email. email. Then he responded, Dana, I interpret your statement below as an intentional work stoppage. This is unacceptable and will subject you to discipline. If you disagree whether the hospital has complied with its obligations to you, there are appropriate mechanisms to address that. Purposefully failing to come to work is clearly not one of them. Also, I believe that I have fully addressed your most recent FMLA application in an email on September 24th. Aaron. And then I well, wrote... What, what, was there such an email and what did he say? <laughs> he, there was no such email. I scrolled well, down, I couldn't see. There was an email, there's nothing addressing my FMLA request, which is why the union filed a grievance and so on. I responded to this email and I was furious. I wrote, Aaron, looking to seize any and every opportunity to discipline me, you can interpret my statement as inten intentional work stoppage and create a new false pretext to discipline me, just like patient abandonment. The only patient that was ever abandoned was Daniel Iverson, who is dead now. I was not paid for my work on the last payday, and not only have I not received an apology for this, I've been met with complete apathy by Annette Mendez and a barrage of lies from you, including that I did not object to not being paid. The hos hospital's failure to pay me is just another layer of this ongoing campaign of harassment, and it was intentionally acted out. But your, by your own declaration, you could see no error. Um, as per the union, you were informed by James Ferris that the hospital could rectify the situation by paying me within three days. Instead, this was ignored also. Due to Roosevelt Hospital's failure to pay me my earned wages last week, I've incurred almost $400 in overdraft fees from TD Bank. I was unable to pay my rent and this creates immense tension in my life. Due to this uh, campaign of harassment, of which, of which withholding my paycheck is only one layer, my health is suffering immensely. Seeing the overdraft fees on my bank statement gives me insomnia. <laughs> I don't know why. I, after, after conferring with a close friend yesterday regarding these issues, I decided that I would come. I, when I say a close friend, I was referring to James Ferris from the oh. union. <laughs> Uh, I decided that I will come to work tomorrow after all, as I need money. However, James Ferris had told me, whatever you do, don't, don't give them, the, don't give them the intentional work <laughs> stoppage card to play, right. because they'll play it. Uh -huh. And so James Ferris told me to write an email and let them know I'll be coming to work. And so this is what I, I wrote. After conferring with a close friend yesterday regarding these issues, I decided that I will come to work tomorrow after all, as I need money. However, after an entire day and night of feeling anxious and suffering from insomnia, uh, I called in sick at 2.22 a.m. to the nursing office. I think what I did is I called in sick, but then I ended up going to work. Cause oh, just to I, cover your bases. Yeah. Um, your actions are affecting my health on every level, emotionally and physically. In the best interest of my patients, I called in sick. Or maybe I did call in sick one day. Oh, that's right. I called in sick. <laughs> that's right. I, I called in sick that day as opposed to just not coming to work and saying I'm not coming to work and I'm not sick. I called in sick and didn't come to work and took and that's what I did. At that so, time you didn't say which, it wasn't sick, you left it open that it could be sick. Well, no, I called the nursing office and I made a note that I told them I'm calling in sick so that they couldn't say intentional work stoppage because we, we are entitled to call in sick. Right. So 
I, I called in sick. In the best interest of my patients, I called in sick so I do not work when I'm feeling sick and sleep deprived. My being unwell is not news to you, hence my FMLA ap application. Um, you most recently did not address the FMLA application in your email. You merely blamed Liberty Mutual. Yet when, when I speak with Liberty Mutual, they insist that they do not make the final determination of who is or isn't eligible for FMLA, but rather Roosevelt Hospital do. Um, you also told me verbatim in the presence of James Ferris in our August 12th, 2013 meeting that you would conduct an investigation into the incident with registered nurse Jennifer Cady and get back to me within, within one week. And Jennifer Cady uh, refused to treat a patient with chest pain that, and she was yelling at me and there was this whole drama. Um, you then changed your story and told me that Miss Wilson would conduct the investigation. It is now two months since we met and nothing has ever been done. I even brought up the hostile workplace environment in a conversation with Miss Wilson just this past Monday and she held out her arm and told me stop, I will not discuss this. Are you aware that registered nurse Lona Stewart refused to take report from me last week? Charge nurse Salia did nothing but assured me that Lona is rude to everyone and that I should not take it personally. Why do you allow for this behaviour? When I bring to your attention that a critically ill CCU patient was improperly managed, you should be thanking me rather than threatening me with encryption violations. I have asked time and time again for a, a Continuum Health Partners email account that would ensure encryption. Even as far back as the days of Eileen Yost, Matthew Landers was also attempting to obtain an email account for me. It was never a priority of Roosevelt Hospital to honor me with a, a chipnet email account. I have not been threatened I will not be threatened with discipline for reporting to you about the disgusting way in which CCU patients were managed. Please stop threatening me with discipline. I will not be subjected to any further bullying and harassment by Roosevelt Hospital. Wow, I like that language. Yeah, that's got me to where I am now. That got me to being suspended. That language they did point to and complain Right about. after this is when I got suspended for the HIPAA. And, and, and I meant, make mention of it here, <coughs> that they were threatening to discipline me. So the HIPAA hearing that, happened after this email? Just, <coughs> just days later. Oh, just, first they played the wages, withholding your wages. Yes. And now they said, now we're going to hit her with our paper monster. Yeah, and in the middle they threatened me with the intentional work stoppage discipline because I said I won't come to work if I'm not going to get paid, which I think is not crazy after a can, week of not being paid. Can I ask one little simple question? Sure. That money that you were fighting over, did you ever get it? Yes. And, and when, when, how did that actually happen? the following pay period. Well, they just decided they were going to insist that they would include it in the next, and uh, your union said that is cheating on the deal. The union time. was very angry. I wanted to push it to another gr grievance hearing, and they said, they said to me, we have to pick our ba battles with them. You know, they've paid you. We've got so many other grievances going on. All you had was the delay. They, they said, you know, but then I wanted the hospital to reimburse me for the overdraft fees. And the hospital told me that they would not. Um, and that's a whole, uh, that's that a whole other story. That was an ambitious idea that you did go after them for that. You know, I, that is, I yeah. still am going after for it. They, I incurred those overdraft fees because I didn't get paid on time. And I had paid bills and... Usually it's a direct deposit. I know every second Wednesday I get my salary. I know I can plan what I'm going to pay. There once was a time when I did have savings in the bank, but this is all after two years, nearly two years of being unemployed. This is after I was reinstated. 
uh, and I was in a financial mess from that whole wrongful termination that they put me in and um, you know the, the, at the, in this point in time I didn't have money lying in the bank that was just you know. Can I mention to our listening audience the magnitude of the numbers we're talking? Because sure. I think that gives you status for people to realize that as a choosing the career nurse, caring for people in the emergency triage specialty, <clears throat> your salary had climbed in 17 years to something more or less $100,000 a year? 102000 yeah, that's gross. And that's what they were suddenly stopping and, uh, at, at will and saying, oh, what, did we, Did you miss a check? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a bi-weekly payment. So for those two weeks, I wasn't paid. But every two weeks, I rely on my salary coming in. At least I did in that. And um, that really messed me up. And As and a, then they did, but then to think now that they did this again is even more disturbing. You know, in your story, we looked it over, one of the highlights of your story is that as you have a hearing, there is a dispute before, I think, Ellen Warren or something like that. Norman Werner? No, uh, anyhow, as to... Aaron uh, Cranich. No, a woman who then finally says, oh, I know her, she's the whistleblower. Wendy O'Brien. Right. So that's yeah. an amazing story. It's unbelievable. That, that, that just she happened. pretends and then it comes right out, hello, do you know her? Oh yeah, she's the whistleblower. That yeah. story is like a, a good piece of the puzzle. Yeah. But let's pretend nobody heard what I said and uh, what's the story? With, with that? Yeah. Um, in November and December last year, when all this had peaked to a point the worst, other than the fact that I was working full time in this hostile environment and management were doing all these things, I was actually being receiving threats at work, veiled threats for the most part, and some were direct, but things like don't walk home alone, uh, don't go to your locker alone, uh, we know where you live, we know what gym you go to, we know where you walk your dog. Um, oh God, <laughs> what else? You were being terrorized. I was terrorized. I was actually scared even at work. I would I just did, didn't know who, even the people that were acting friendly, I didn't know if they were my friends or not. But again, um, to but, me it comes down to that first one that I made a big deal of. You have a lot of haters here. Nobody here is your friend. Yeah. And um, there were there were a lot of there was a lot of this, and then there was a lot of direct, like bullying and aggression that was coming from my coworkers, and clearly from management. And it it became, I mean, I literally suffered from very severe insomnia. I was very anxious at work. Then I started getting, because they told me don't walk home alone, I, st I was actually so scared. You know, when I, my shift finishes, it's like 11.30 p.m. close to midnight when I leave the hospital. It's 59th Street, Midtown. It's a really dodgy area at night and I'm alone walking out in my scrubs and I'm like totally scared. I, I never was before but I started to be scared leaving the hospital building. It's completely dark. The streets are vacant and I started to imagine like you know any something could happen to me right now. I don't know. I uh, never used to have these kind of fears but these and in fact, it was actually so pronounced that I told um, Aaron Cranich about this. I told my manager about this and their solution was that I can ask a security guard to come with me to the locker 
and I can ask a security guard to escort me out of the hospital building at the end of my shift. Um, and I did do that. I actually did do that. I did always you walk her to the bus stop. <laughs> no, that's the thing. Yeah. I still had to walk all the way to either Ninth or Tenth Avenue, and they would only walk me out. And you know. Um, Which door did you walk out to where the garden is or emergency, off the side? The emergency room uh, doors, 59, 59th 60th, Street. 59. Yeah. And um, basically I went to my doctor. Is in, that number 428? I don't know. It's no. considered 1010th Avenue. Okay. Which is the front yeah. hus- entrance to the hospital. Okay. Um, I didn't really know what to do anymore and I went to my doctor not because I'm actually like a fitness freak I run marathons and I go to the gym and I don't usually get sick at all but I was suffering from insomnia and quite severely and yeah, what's that like in other words it's horrible you're, you're, you were living in this in this place yeah and your bed was up in the air or was that on the floor that bed was yeah this loft, loft bed, bed. Off bed, check. And um, would you stay in the bed or you'd climb down? At night? Um, you would just twist and turn and it just wouldn't, sleep wouldn't come? Well, I used to have a big television here once upon a time. Uh-huh. And so I would often watch movies or watch television. Um, I would read, I would play on my computer, I would, I would get up and I would get up and go and walk around outside. I, I don't know, like some nights I would just put a pillow over my face and tell myself, sleep, sleep. I, I mean, I don't know. When you can't sleep, it's it's actually quite horrible. You know, after, if you go for three days and three nights with no sleep, it's paralyzing. It's, it's not fun. Now, while yeah. you're not sleeping, are you in touch with ideas, feelings that are related to the case that you can actually po- po- point to and focus on and blame? During the time when I was... In other words, your suffering at work. Yeah. Were the... Um, oh, yeah. Was there some language you make the connection when you couldn't sleep? Like, what are you, what are you haunted by? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I... Um, I'm kind of embarrassed to say it now, but I don't, it, like, it is what it is. Um, you know, it was, I would imagine things. I would imagine coming into my apartment and someone would stab me. I would imagine uh, when I would walk my dog and I would see someone rummaging through the trash cans outside, I would think that maybe they're watching to see what time I walk my dog. Like maybe someone's hiring these people to see when I come and go from my building. When I go to the gym to do a yoga class, maybe I would see someone sitting in a parked car on the street, you know, just No, wait, just hold on there. You just recited yeah. exactly what was part of their official notifications by their network of... Um, um, get even against whistleblower strategy yeah. and you were saying each little message as if it had been designed by a psychological operations team each <laughs> one and you were then and you were just reciting how they worked oh they were i mean i look i can't i don't know if there was a psychological operations team that they said we know which gym and oh. boeing that got you there yeah, but these were co-workers that were saying it. I don't know where these messages were coming from. I can... It sounds I, like they were rehearsed. Like these were from a... They, they definitely took their toll on me. They... It was... It, would, it was... But the thing is, I would tell myself, no, 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 Donna, stop it. Stop it. You know, I would snap myself. Every time I would... I would even look across the street at the building across the street and if I would see someone in the window, 
I would think maybe they're gonna pull out a gun or like, I would think crazy thoughts and I would immediately tell myself stop it don't don't go there and you know and I fought it I fought it a lot I mean I really fought it it was like a war in my head that went on day after day after day and you walked the dog every day and it was scary every time I was terrified I even um, I was actually um, carrying my house keys with a key poking out from each finger. Oh, to, like, to scare somebody with the no, just, with a punch? No, I wasn't trying to scare anyone, but I was so scared that someone could be following me that I would be like, ready for to have something. As a weapon. Yeah, just, no, I wasn't like, you know... I was that, you know, I've never done that before. I've never walked around, not even in Israel, you know, I never walked around, you know, Ready prepared for, for an attack. But I was like, I was just perpetually scared. And then I went to my doctor because I just didn't know really what el where else to go. And I wasn't sick as in, you know, I was healthy, I was fit, but I just, I was just didn't know who to talk to anymore and I didn't trust anyone and um, my doctors told me um, that I have PTSD he said that um, I mean I went, when I went to my doctor and you just have to know I never go to doctors like I would have to be bleeding from my eyeballs before I went to see a doctor like I don't get flu vaccines I don't I don't go, if I have a cough or a cold or a back pain or anything, I'm not going to go running to a doctor. This was like, the fact that I even went to my doctor was in itself. And even when I went there, I was like, I don't know why I'm going, I didn't know what I really expected him to do or say. But I went there and when I sat in his office, I just started to cry and cry and cry. And I, I had pimples all over my face um, from not sleeping, from not eating properly, um, no sunlight. I mean, I didn't go outside at all. I became... Uh, I was not in a good state. My doctor um, told me that I have to stop working there. He said that it's... And he knew the whole story. He knew the whole story. And you know, when you tell me the whole story here, after everything you've suffered, to add on to that pimples. I know. It's terrible. But it, it actually, it, it, it's, it is, it's a, it's, a, it's a hormone imbalance. And it's due, when you sleep, there are hormones that are secreted. It actually... It's a physical symptom of stress and lack of sleep. And um, people that are stressed and suffering from insomnia, they, well, they often get developed pimples and anyway, it's not the worst thing, but I had, you know, dark circles under my eyes. I was very pale. Um, I, I just didn't look healthy. Do people and say that to you? when they're... Everyone. In fact, I would even go to the supermarket and the, peop the girl there would say, you look so tired. I would walk my dog in the park and people would say, are you okay? Everyone would say to me, are you okay? Are you okay? Everywhere I would go, people, in the gym, I would go to the gym, everyone would say to me, you, you, look, you don't look well. You don't. Some people would... You know, my good friends would say, Donna, you look like complete shit. Like, you know, you know, I've, people that knew me well would just tell me, you look like total shit. Like, I've never seen you like this. Um, and, I mean, you only have to see photos of me from, from, you know, a few years before. I was, you know, running marathons and I was like, fitness Tell me, could junkie. you just flesh out the marathon idea? What, yeah. what did, how long is a marathon and how many how many of them did you do? I haven't done that many. I've done like six in six total. Six marathons, that's pretty and good. And I've done a lot of half marathons. And they're about and 20 miles? 26.2 miles is a marathon. And um, I did the San Francisco Marathon. 
I did a bunch of New York did you, marathons. Did you accomplish the trick of not stopping? Yeah, um, it, there's only one where I stopped. Really? The very first one that I ran. The others I never stopped. At the worst, I would go to a slow jog, but I wouldn't. Stopping is the worst thing you can do. Oh, <laughs> Once you stop, that's it. You're you're done. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> you did marathons. That's, yeah, that's, I mean, I did a lot of things. That's good training for this legal battle. <laughs> it's good. It's amazing how much uh, it tests your mental strength, actually. It's an incredible amount of strength. It's not even about your physical strength. To mentally endure a marathon is quite a challenge. <sighs> so, we have but told I, quite a bit of the story. Go ahead. Do you want me to answer your question? Yeah. My doctor told me to stop working and he wrote me a letter which I gave to the hospital saying, uh, saying that I ha I'm due to the hostile work environment, I'm suffering from post-traumatic, not just the hostile work environment, wrongful termination, a one year, nine month arbitration, <laughs> legal battle, retaliation, not being paid, all of it. The hostile, the threats. He said, due to all of this, you know, I'm I'm suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder, and um, he wrote them a letter saying that I need to take time off work. And so I took a, a couple of weeks off work, and I just called in sick every day. And I gave them the letter from my doctor, but they were not they were not going to have that. They told me you can't just call in sick you have to apply for a medical leave of absence. And I said, well, how do I do that? Considering that they denied me the previous one, um, which the union grieved, and the, um, they sent me PDF documents and told me your doctor needs to fill in all this paperwork and you need to submit this to human resources and you need to send this to Liberty Mutual and... Um, my doctor filled in all the paperwork, we submitted it, and they lost it. Wow. They lost all the documents. Luckily, I had yeah. a copy, and we re this time James Ferris from the union said, give it to me, I will give it to them in, by hand. I will hand deliver it. Because we both, James Ferris knew that they conveniently lost my paperwork. Wow. So he took it in, and this time it was submitted, and they denied it. They denied it. And they denied it on the grounds that in the application, my doctor wrote uh, workplace hostility. And they claimed that if my illness is due to a workplace condition, it should not be a medical leave of absence that I apply for. It should be workers' compensation that I apply for. <laughs> that was exactly what they... I have this in emails too. So then I said to them, okay, how do I apply for workers' comp? And they sent me a new set of documents and they said, your doctor needs to fill this in. And, and I was like, why didn't you tell me this in the first place? And anyway, my doctor filled in the workers' comp application and I submitted that. And of course, they denied that as well. After they instructed me to apply for it, they then denied it. You did all that and work. My... And so I received a letter from the workers' comp board saying, we've received your application, your employer is disputing the application and we are going to conduct a hearing and you must come on this day and this time. So I went to this hearing and the hospital's insurance company attorneys were there and I didn't know any of them, but they all you know, acted like they knew me so well. I've never seen them in my life, but um, they put forward a, a something to an argument to the judge about. Um, oh, they claimed that working in an emergency room is a stressful job. That was kind of their claim. 
that it's a stressful job. You know, working there, stress comes with the job. That was kind of their argument. Uh, I didn't have an attorney. I represented myself. And I, I, I told the judge I need more time to find an attorney. The judge actually advised me that I shouldn't speak and I should get an attorney. That was actually his advice to me. So I took his advice and I said fine and he gave me another whatever 30 days and I came to another hearing with an attorney now and this was just a few weeks ago and the hospital brought Wendy O'Brien who's from Human Resources and she has the title of Head of Patient Care and uh, or director of patient care or something like that and she came as a witness to the workers comp hearing to testify for the hospital and she took an oath to tell the truth and she was on the witness stand and the judge was there and my attorney had an opportunity to cross-examine her and he asked her um, how do you know Dana? She, she was actually honest. She said, look, I know Dana. She said, I've only really met Dana a couple of occasions. Uh, the last time was at a grievance hearing, which was true. And my attorney said, are you Dana's direct supervisor? She said, no, Dana. She says, no, I am higher up the chain. Um, Dana has her own manager that she reports to. So my attorney asked her, so if Dana had a problem, would she come directly to you? And she said, no, Dana would go to her manager. If the problem couldn't be resolved on that level, then it would come higher up the chain to me. And that's all true. And then my attorney said to her, so you don't work directly with Dana. She said, no. And then he said, so what do you know about Dana? And the first thing she said is, well, I know that Dana is a whistleblower. The first thing came out of her mouth. So that was, um, that's what I'm going to use, resubmit as new evidence to the Supreme Court. Um, is because, that what you wanted to know? Yes, yeah. because her role in the hearing was in the other direction. It was supposed to be, but she really, she came there for the hospital, but she really only kind of... Um, she fought that proposition in the hearing. She said contrary to that. She pushed in the other direction. In which hearing? <laughs> it does get in the In the... Um, There's been a lot. Not the one where she admits whistleblower, the other hearing, the one she's talking about. The, uh, the she, only said, a, she said she was in the hearing with you. Yeah, she was in the HIPAA grievance hearing. Okay, oh, that he ran. She was there. But didn't, was that an issue at that hearing that she sort of pretended like it wasn't an issue? Did that, could we fault her there? No, what happened there was they were accusing me of breaking HIPAA laws and James Ferris had an email that she herself had sent him with patient health information about a patient and yet she was part of the panel there that was disciplining me for doing and, exactly what she and, had done and James Ferris called her out on it in that meeting and yeah so like but did she have a comeback? She, she, she knew that she had been cornered, so she subtly said, um, well, you know, if, if, I, if I was to break HIPAA laws, I would expect to receive the same type of discipline that, that we are giving Dana here today. But she only said that after James Ferris called her out on, he, he basically let her know, I haven't something that you have sent me yourself <laughs> many things in fact so you know it's all like it's 
all like a silly game of politics. But one thing that stands out also in your story is that early on, when you had some trouble and you called your union, they said, oh, you're a whistleblower. Mm -hmm. In other words, there is that category that there is that problem. There, you're not the first victim of what happens to whistleblowers. No, yes. They, yes and no. They did tell me I'm a whistleblower even long before I was terminated. Um, in fact, it was Mercedes Herman who was the union representative. This was only weeks after Daniel Iverson had died and, and he was at the medical examiner. There, there was still no autopsy result and everyone in the emergency room knew that I had informed Dr. Carey Everyone knew that he was at the medical examiner. Everyone was being hostile towards me. My manager, Eileen Yost, was being hostile towards me. Jennifer Cady, the nurse that really was the ringleader of the whole thing, she was being hostile. And that's when I went to the union to ask them for advice. In fact, that was the first time in my life that I have ever gone to the to a nurses union for any kind of help ever in 17 years of being a nurse I've never like sought a union for anything but I was I didn't know who to speak to I someone said go speak to the union that's what they're there for I didn't even know really you know I don't know the union was something that I never even gave thought to but I met with Mercedes Herman. I told her the story and she told me straight out, you're a whistleblower. You need to dot your I's, cross your T's. They will do anything to terminate you. She made it, she did not even sugarcoat it. She said it very, very bluntly. And she was dead on. <laughs> she, she was like, I mean, prophetic in her words. <laughs> And the union, uh, James Ferris, till this day, Claire Tuck, the union lawyer, they all maintain that I am a whistleblower. That there's no question in their mind that what I did qualifies me as a whistleblower. And in fact, I've spoken with the Department of Labor, I've spoken with OSHA, I've spoken with, you know, the NLRB, Division of Human Rights, um, I've filed many complaints with different um, agencies about all the retaliation, the not being paid, and they all see me as a whistleblower. There's no question, there's no doubt in that, as far as that's concerned. And clearly, the hospital sees me as a whistleblower. But there was a hearing in which the hearing officer said. The whistleblower protections require activity within a narrow f time frame of what, three months? That was Judge York in the Supreme Court. Yes, but he, you know, he didn't even say it. He, he more or less asked it. He didn't know. He was asking Wilson Elser to, to, if they knew. And they said that they didn't know either. I wish I had the transcript here. Because but your point was, is that it is a continuous harassment and absolutely. because it is continuing, you are continuing to be entitled to what whistleblowers are entitled to, which mm -hmm. is the right to complain, the right to sue, the right to have a court focus on the, on the harm that's being done to you. Sure, yes. But this is America. <laughs> I think that the word whistleblower in, in I, I don't know, I could be wrong, but I think it, to some people it has a negative connotation. Oh, it does. But it's really a truth speaker. It's someone that comes out and tells the truth. And how can that ever be wrong? When can telling the truth be considered wrong? I, I personally cannot justify any scenario where telling the truth is wrong. Maybe 
you can say violating HIPAA laws is wrong. I would agree with that. If, if you're a patient in a hospital and you expect your privacy, privacy to be upheld, fair enough. But I didn't break HIPAA laws. I tried to assist a patient who was being treated poorly and my intention was to bring this to the, uh, to the to management's knowledge, to their awareness. But um, whistleblowers get a very bad rap in society and, and, and even in the judicial system. It, the judicial system, they often drown in the judicial system. And unfortunately, lawyers have their own agenda so you could be a whistleblower and a lawyer could say, I'll represent you, but they have their own uh, agenda too. They, they're not, you know, I'm generalizing here. But um, I don't know, Joe, guide me a little bit. <laughs> um, well, you know, I'm glad we did this. That I think we did summarize I think a lot of the features of the case, let's just try to do a summary at this point, that we were just closing up with the idea of whistleblowing in general. And, and this is a story about what happens to a whistleblower. And you did get a chance to describe in pretty good detail what you suffered by way of, a, it seems like a strategy from management in which individual low level employees would pass you little messages to get you paranoid yeah. and to say we know where you go to the gym, we know where you walk your dog. It's as if they had hired an expert to check you out and play this game. Like it's, it's a deliberate game. That's they, what I'm hearing. Yeah. They also accused me of things that were just crazily untrue, like racism. They like, accuse you of racism. Not the hospital, the nurse, the the, the staff within the emergency room. Oh. There was slanderous. Uh, I I know even, you know, there was this nurse Jennifer Cady who mm. was spreading rumors that I hate Filipino people, that I hate black people, and w anyone that knows me, <laughs> I am like the furthest thing from racist. In fact, I love uh, oneness. I love humanity as a whole. Anyone that knows me would know that. I have so many emails here that I just wish I could show you. Well, I want to give you credit for this. You did, you did maintain your record well, and you did plenty of work. I mean, we, we're getting a piece of, I mean, to call you a hero, I mean, in order to take on the role of being a truth teller, uh, a whistleblower as a form of truth teller, <sighs> you had to uh, respond to each of their deals with eloquence, with words put in the right place, and you, your language is um, clear. I, you, you delivered. I, yeah, <laughs> it wasn't always eloquent. There were, you know, in the early days when this all started, I just broke down and cried every day. I was a wreck. When I was wrongfully terminated and put through this arbitration, I was really not in a good space. This last year, two years, since I was reinstated and I was subjected to all this, I started to see it. I mean, I really started to see the pattern that they were, like the way they were doing it and how I could see that when I would complain to the management that they would do nothing and I could see that they were not on my side. And I could see that when I brought legitimate complaints to them, that they would just overlook them. In the early days, I would even apologize. They would make me feel guilty. And I was pathetic in the beginning. Now I, I know myself. I know the truth. I hold my own. And yeah, I started to realize, hey, if they're going to lie, I'm going to send them an email and I'm going to let them know this is a lie. That's a lie. And then I realized, hey, I can speak up for myself. I don't have to just be, you know, curl up in a ball and sit in the corner and cry. I can write them back and say, hey, call them out on everything that they do. 
And if the union can't help me, I'll go to the NLRB. And if the NLRB can't help me, I'll go to the Division of Human Rights. And, and I started to make phone calls and I started to, you know, I spoke to various attorneys and I, I just decided I'm not going to allow for this. And it's not even, it's not even, um, it's not even just about me. It's about the fact that, that if they do this to me, they can do it to anyone. And, and someone has to break this system. Someone has to stand up to it. And I think that I say this now and I say it with pride. I used to always say, why did all this happen to me? Kind of like a victim. Why did all this happen to me? Why me? Now I realize none of this happened to me. I happened to them. And that's how I see it. I'm not the victim. I'm the victor. And, and none of this happened to me. I brought truth into a place of darkness and a place of corruption and in fact I happened to them. They have probably spent a few million dollars on their legal team Wilson Elser by this point. We're now four years into this. Someone that I know called Wilson Elser um, on my part to ask them if they would be willing to settle with me, with, if the hospital would be willing to settle with me and Ricky Rower who's the the head of the Wilson Elser law firm in New York said on the phone gleefully laughing and all she said oh Dana Novak we love her here she's generated more money for our firm than anyone in, in history because Roosevelt Hospital has been paying Wilson Elser for years probably millions of, just from me and that's really a loss to the hospital <laughs> So whichever way you look at it, and it's not about money, it's about truth. You know, I have fractured their, their, their perfect little system. I've put a, a kink in it, if nothing else. So right now yes. you're uh, preparing an appeal, and this latest good news you can use to uh, drive home, you win the uh, requested time to extend your time to per perfect your... Yeah, there's, there's two good news. There's winning the arbitration, uh, the HIPAA arbitration, which, and Wendy O'Brien's tes testimony under oath, which is on transcript, saying that I'm a whistleblower, <laughs> which I can now submit as evidence to the court. And I fully intend to do this.